a lot of luck involved with being an NFL player, whether a lot of guys get their chance by somebody in front of them getting hurt. I had that happen once in my career, and I also got hurt at the same time. So, I mean, like, there's there's some unfortunate things. But I made a career out of it just by pushing, by continuing to produce and having a good attitude. If you're, I think if you're going to start a business, uh, you have to be willing to grind. There's no doubt about it. You have to be able to get up each day and want it and push harder than the next guy. And it's kind of a sports cliche, but it's, it's truth. I mean, that's it. It's having grit. Welcome to the Pivotal Leader Podcast with Gina Tremarco. Featuring lively interviews with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who share their stories and best practices for shifting business from problems to profits. Sit back and get ready to pivot. Hey, everyone. This is Gina Tremarco, Chief Results Officer at Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. Each week on The Pivotal Leader, I feature inspirational leaders who know how to positively impact their customers, employees, and brand through culture building. On this episode of The Pivotal Leader, I'm interviewing Nate Lawry, CEO of Brazen Life. Nate played eight years of professional football in both the National Football League for the Buccaneers and the Saints and the Bengals and United Football League for Sacramento Mountain Lions before retiring after the 2011 season. A self-described NFL grinder, Lawry fought through numerous injuries throughout his pro career, which led him to rethink many of the products he was using to take care of his body wanting tools that were more convenient to use without compromising functionality. He graduated from Yale University in 2004 with a degree in political science. He has completed NFL-sponsored executive education programs at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, University of Pennsylvania Wharton, Northwestern University Kellogg, and Babson College. Born in Indianapolis, Indiana, from the Midwest where I'm from, but I'm from Chicago, he now resides in Santa Barbara, California with his wife and two young children. In 2015, Nate launched a new business called Brazen Life. Brazen Life is dedicated to helping people achieve their fitness and health goals through innovative, high-quality, and travel-ready recovery and fitness tools. Brazen's launch product is the Morph Collapsible Foam Roller, a premium foam roller that folds flat, making it easy to use at home, the office, the gym, or the road. So let's dive into this episode and learn from Nate Laurie. Hey, Nate, welcome to the Pivotal Leader. Thanks, Gina. I'm glad to be here. This is exciting. So I want to I wanna jump in. I, you know, I was right into you, you went into creating a product from being a, a professional ball player to creating a product. And it really made me think about, you know, even in a lot of work I do as a speaker, as a trainer, I am the product often. And one day I got sick and I'm like, okay, there's got to be something else because if I'm in a hospital bed, which happened, I can't go out and the product can't work. And so I need something else. And I'm, I'm going to guess it's the same thing for professional athletes. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a very good question. I, I've always kind of uh, made the analogy of you know, as a professional football player, you really are your own product. I mean, you're playing for your team. You're within an organization. There's kind of a traditional structure there uh, as far as being an employee. But at the end of the day, you're really a sole proprietor, and you're you're kind of like a, a contractor, right? That's that's um, going out and trying to put your best product on the field every day. And it's so competitive that at any time um, that that can be taken away from you. And so totally, like if you're not, if you're having a bad day, if you're feeling sick, uh, you have an injury, then they're going to go find somebody to replace mm -hmm. you because they need, they need to fill out the, you know, a certain number of spots and put the best, uh, put the best team forward each week. So it's totally like that. And yeah, transitioning into entrepreneurial worlds, I, you know, I, I kind of feel like, um, I've been able to take a lot of those lessons as a, as a football player and kind of put them into what I wanted to create as a business and uh, how I approach business and, and just kind of took that level of professionalism that it took. And yeah, yeah, here I am. So how did you, how did you, let's talk about the product. How did you get to creating, creating your product and tell mm -hmm. the audience a little bit about it as if they don't know anything about it? Yeah, yeah. So what it is, is it's a collapsible foam roller. Uh, and, you know, when I first started talking about this idea, people would kind of like look at me like, what is a foam roller? 
Uh, and, and in the time that, you know, it took me to develop it and get it right, pretty much everyone knows what a foam roller is. So a foam roller is uh, a, a six inch generally cylinder that you use your body weight to roll on to massage your muscles. And it's really good for myofascial release, for massage, yes. for stretching. Uh, there's core stability stuff that you can do. And they're awesome tools. And I invented the first one that's collapsible. So you can put in a backpack and carry on. You can take it with you uh, when you're on the road and, and not let your, your body suffer, not let your routine suffer uh, just because you're traveling or just because you're going to the gym or out to the track to do a run or whatever it is. I wanted to create a tool or the office. You know, if you're, you're sitting at a desk long hours a day, you get stiff. I wanted to create a tool that you could always have right there at hand to take care of your body. And um, the idea being, if you could use it consistently, then you're going to get a ton more value out of it because, you know, uh, foam rolling consistently proves uh, to be a big benefit over the long run for the rest of your life, uh, just keeping that practice. And so, yeah, kind of um, when I was playing, I, I had a bad back injury and wanted to be able to uh, take care of my body in better ways. And through the recovery process, I really learned how to use a foam roller and wasn't traveling with the foam roller when I was playing. And even though that was like the one tool that I relied on on a daily basis, uh, just because they're bulky and they're a pain to stick in my backpack, I, I didn't want to put in my carry on because I had other stuff and I would leave it and then I'd come back and I'd be stiff, I'd be sore. I had this concept of making a product that was as good as anything else on the market I could also stick in my backpack because like, why wouldn't you want to have that if you're relying on tools like that to, to help you move and feel better? And so, yeah, that was the concept. When I was playing football, I had this idea and I, I shelled it as I was playing. And then for about a year or two after, while well, I was kind of making my transition into entrepreneurism and into the business world, you know, kind of got to a point where I was really passionate to start developing it and built a product in a garage thought like when I when I got on it and put my body weight on it it would it would just collapse immediately and that would be it but it didn't help me just like this very rudimentary prototype with with uh, stuff from Home Depot that kind of sparked it I was I was excited to like build this thing that I thought could be really really cool and could help people a ton um, and and yeah a couple of years later here we are I know what a foam roller is because it did have plantar fasciitis so mm. Um, I have plenty of foam rollers and I know <laughs> the value of them, even from when I was working out a lot, I needed them. And there was a point actually, actually when I got sick, uh, I was anemic and it, it turns out that I don't think I had circulation, which is what tightened all of my leg muscles. Mm -hmm. So my leg muscles were so tight that um because i didn't have the blood circuit because i didn't have blood and <laughs> and it turned out that um I, I mean i was using that roller all the time but having um a collapsible roller would be amazing yeah yeah exactly so uh especially if you have any back pain any chronic pain acute injury or acute physical condition that you're trying to treat having a foam roller uh can can be a real godsend and you know, you go to any physical therapist and they'll have foam rollers there. A good physical therapist will teach you how to use it. I had used foam rollers a little bit, you know, prior to my, my injury. So I graduated from Yale in 2004, was an All-American tight end. I uh, was fortunate enough to be drafted into, by, by the Buccaneers out of college, which is, is pretty unique for uh, an Ivy League grad. And then played a couple years in Tampa. I was with the Saints in my third year. And that's when I had the back injury. So prior to that, I had used foam rollers kind of sparingly just here and there as, you know, as we were warming up or something and then ended up needing back surgery. And that, I mean, that year with the Saints was amazing. It was like the funnest year uh, of, of my pro football career because it was the year we were coming back from Hurricane Katrina back into New Orleans and kind of rebuilding the city. And I was playing a ton and then just had this like nagging back injury that got worse and worse throughout the season. I was, I pushed it as long as I could and got to the point where, you know, there was no avoiding a surgery. I had a, a micro discectomy. They, they went and cleaned up the discs and I was out and wondered if I'd play football again. And then kind of in that recovery process, I was taught by a good physical therapist, essentially how, how to use a foam roller, how to do some like core strengthening, stability exercises on it, how to stretch on it. Um, uh, on top of just like the myofascial massage and just general body alignment stuff that you can do on it. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I really committed to, to putting that into my, my routine 
and it made a huge difference. Uh, you know, I didn't have to spend 60 bucks, uh, or 70 bucks, 80 bucks, 90 bucks on a massage a couple times a week just to stay healthy. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so it was like a, a core part of my, my routine. They do make a big difference. Like you said, increased circulation. There's a lot of good things that if you use it properly, can come out of using just a simple tool like a, a cylinder. Uh, so what was the what was the process for getting it created and mm-hmm. getting it going? Like what did what did that look like? And I'm sure there was some people around you going, "You want to do what?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, I talked about it for a while, um, and and definitely got some you know question looks. It was uh, you know it was an idea at first, and and basically the concept was to have an outer shell that could, could move, uh, independent of an inner core system that could support the outer shell. And what I originally imagined was much different than where we ended up. And it was just a kind of an iterative process over a number of years, trying to perfect it and get it right and make sure that it was it met all of this criteria that we set out at the beginning to, to accomplish. Creating products is tough. I will mm-hmm. never sugarcoat that. And especially doing it and trying to prepare something for mass production because there's so much that goes into it. You know, there's the engineering side of it, the production engineering side of it, the marketing side of it, preparing it. And I mean, there's great tools now that you can take advantage of to test ideas in kind of a lean way. And and we took advantage of, of everything we could. But yeah, I mean, it was like, like I said, it was originally an idea that I had. Um, and I, I went out and grabbed some stuff from Home Depot. I've always been pretty handy, always had kind of an engineering mindset. And, and so uh, built something in the garage uh, that worked fairly well. And then uh, we had, we had a a team. So my father-in-law has a, a manufacturing facility in Romania that does something completely different. They have uh, precision parts, hydraulics, big, like expensive machines making very precise hydraulic pieces. I was able to kind of take this prototype, give it to them. And they had technical expertise over there. They came back with uh, one core improvement. And from there, it was just like step by step. How do we make this better? How do we make this more usable? Um, and to be strong and lightweight and the foam rolling surface that somebody wants out of a good foam roller and like to tick all the boxes to make sure that the product, when you use it, had no compromises over uh, a normal uh, everyday product, but also had this portability and it was something that you'd want to keep in your backpack. So yeah, it was just like defining, having a good definition of what the end product should be and going out to achieve all those objectives. And we just did it little by little, and, and we got to a place where we felt good about launching it. And then, like I said, the tools out there, we did a Kickstarter campaign. Nowadays, is, there's a lot of work that goes into a successful Kickstarter campaign. Back in the day... It used I, to can't, I can't just start one and, woo, <laughs> we're, we're good. <laughs> um, I mean, you could, but you probably wouldn't be good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, the guys that, that do really well are they approach it from kind of a professional standpoint and it's, it's, it's become a, you have to do a lot of prep work for it. It used to be, uh, I think in the original days of like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, you could put a project up and let the organic nature of your project and uh, internet share it. And it was kind of a smaller community. So people would share uh, good projects. And now everyone's caught on to this is like a really good tool to, to te- product test ideas. And so there's been a lot of infrastructure built on the back end of preparing for a good Kickstarter campaign and the marketing side of it and all that stuff. So yeah, we did that. It's, it's a way better way to do that. Uh, even if you're gonna have to spend a little more money than you did maybe a decade ago to get that kind of that traction, it's still much cheaper than going fully into production, producing a product, trying to launch it on your own, garner the interest and then, you know, create a platform off of it. So, so we use that and that went really well. And then over the next year, basically we're figuring out production and it took us a lot longer than we expected. We thought going into the campaign, we, we had it all, all dialed in and we learned a lot going into mass production. And so it took us about a year to get the product shipped even a little bit longer to get all of our pre-orders shipped. Uh, we were in stock for a couple months. And then in, uh, in June of last year, we shot for Shark Tank. And, and then in October, they let us know that they were going to air us. So at the end of October, we aired on Shark Tank. And that, I missed like, it. Now I got to go look for the refund, refund, <laughs> uh, rerun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just on Shark Tank. 
So that was at the end of October, and then they re-aired it again at the end of you know, uh, of December. And I mean, it was such like an incredible response. It was like what, ha- what a- happened on your Shark Tank since I didn't see it? Yeah, so we had a guest shark, Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx. Uh-huh, yeah. And then the the panel besides Sarah was Mark Cuban, Kevin. It was Lori Grenier and Damon John, and it was it was great. I mean, we we went up there, we pitched it, and at the end we had Kevin O'Leary and Damon John <laughs> teaming up and bidding against Sarah Blakely and Lori Grenier, and they were fighting over us a little bit. So I mean, that was just like such a cool thing. I mean, it's such a a powerful show, such a cool platform. And we had a ton of fun with it, just shooting it. And But there's so many unknowns with, with the show, if you're going to air and when it'll be and trying to prepare for that. And in the Who end, we won? Had, Who yeah, won you? We, we took the Sharkettes. So we you went took with, the ladies. Yeah, so yeah. we went with Lori and Sarah. Together? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And it was, uh, so it was fun. And then we had just like a massive response from from the show. And we we sold a ton of, rollers really really fast and we oversold by a lot and wow uh, yeah and that that just put us in a position where we've since really because they re-aired us we've since been uh on this like perpetual back order situation where we're trying to get caught up and uh we we should be through that in in another month and a half but it was so fun i mean those those women are such powerful business women that have such a good mind for marketing and uh, and for selling physical products that, you know, they, they were the the obvious choice for us and yeah. And moving forward, I mean, there's, there's a ton that we're looking to do. We want to continue to develop new tools that are kind of in the same vein, helping people take care of their body just as well on the road as they do at home and, and really, you know, helping people move and feel better. What has been your biggest challenge in this whole process? The biggest challenge there's, uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, everything's a challenge. Um, you know, from having the capital to to get a project started. That's that's tough for any entrepreneur because you're a lot of times when you're small and you you're just starting out, you're putting your own money up front, uh, and that often can feel risky. Um, so having kind of a vision and a passion to to find it uh, to to go for it, uh, and then really taking that risk, and that's that's the first challenge, right? Is just like let's, let's go for it. Let's, um, let's take the leap, see what happens. Let's start as small as we can, but, uh, not sacrifice on professionalism or quality. And we'll, we'll put up the front that we have to, to make us look like uh, we're legit and see what the response is. Right. Um, and then the next step is specifically with manufacturing a physical product. Um, and, and probably in particular our physical product, because we, we combine a lot of uh, a lot of different types of materials to make the foam roller. So what you do is you have these two little pullers on either side. Uh, to open it, you just drop and you pull it. And that makes a nice round wow. foam roller. It's it's very strong to uh, actually roll on. Uh, and then to collapse it, you just push on the the end discs again, collapse it back down, put it back in your backpack, your carry on. And yeah, and you're, you're ready to go. So I, I wish you would have sent that to me before the podcast. That would have been a, we, you know, I, I would have really need to experience it before this conversation. <laughs> you have to experience it. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a couple of different models now. Uh, we have a kind of a uh, more traditional, smoother uh, surface that for people that like just a regular plain foam roller, we have that on offer now too. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a, very high quality roller anyway, but we're using, we're using foam. Uh, we use really eco-friendly materials. So the foam is recyclable. There's no manufacturing waste in doing that. Uh, the part that supports you kind of longitudinally underneath the foam is a bamboo slat. And that's, that's coupled all together with a piece of cordura fabric. And then we have aluminum supports inside and which are obviously recyclable. So, but it's a lot of different materials that we're combining together that are not precision materials and they have to be combined in a very precise manner for it to operate like it should, to have the strength that it should, to be as lightweight as it should, and to have the longevity that it needs to. And it's been a huge learning curve. And we even, you know, through our production are continuing to, to iterate, to improve uh, little parts so that we're always moving the product forward and thinking about better ways to, to manufacture it. 
which will in turn, you know, free us up more time to, to develop the next, the next series of brazen products. So through this process, let's talk a little bit about team. I mean, you're, you're used to working in a team setting Mm -hmm. and as an entrepreneur, you need a team and, uh, you know, this, this show is also a lot about creating culture in your organization. So as a new entrepreneur, um, starting from the ground up, what is, what does your team look like and what kind of support do you have? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my team starts with my family. I have a a wife that's very supportive. That's Uh, really important. Let's stop there (laughs) for a second. How important that is that your spouse is on board. So that's good. Yeah, totally. I mean, her, her dad is an entrepreneur. Uh, when I retired from football, I, I kind of took over one of his businesses that he initially established um, and had gotten away from because he had the manufacturing facility. And that business needed revamped. And I, I took that on and just kind of trial by fire, learned what it took to run a consumer products business. And so through that process, her dad has also become a part of my team. You know, he's, he's a brilliant engineering mind. So I have that uh, and, and has the manufacturing background. So we, we work closely together. Uh, and then through building the, the, you know, the Brazen brand, we brought on new team members and have been lucky with the, the additions that we had. Our, our first employee, is his name's Tom Hopkins. He are, is a competitive track athlete. So he's a decathlete. He was kind of world-class. He you know, placed at the indoors last year in the heptathlon and then uh, I think went to nationals for the decathlon outdoor last, last year. And then, um, so, and he's great. I mean, just hardworking. And, and yeah, I think that's, you know, having gotten a little bit lucky because it was just like, Hey, you know, you need some, some work in the afternoons when you're not training. <laughs> if you want to come, I, I think you'd be really good. And, and, you know, he said it out of the park for us. So building a team that way, we have a good group of advisors that we've brought on since and people that have a lot of experience and some of it's, been been luck and some of it's going out to find the right people that Mm -hmm. you know just having conversations and realizing what people could contribute and and asking them to be a part of it whether in a small way or a big way and to continue to build out that team so yeah we've got we've got a good we're small uh we're scrappy which is what i like to be at this this point yeah i kind of have a philosophy that if people aren't uncomfortable in their daily jobs and they're not, they don't feel a little bit overwhelmed then they're not, you know, they're not growing and they're not going to be, they're not going to be performing, producing really how, how they need to be. So you, you can get bloated pretty quick just because you want to have a normal life. And, and sometimes when a startup, you, you, you can't afford a normal life. There's no, yeah, there's no normal life in a startup. Even, no. even as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm, I'm 10 years in and I'm like, when does it get normal? And then I decided <laughs> it never does. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's the it's your new normal. So uh, I know that's exactly right, but it's so rewarding too. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, when you have something that really hits, and you have a, an idea that is successful, and you know you see the response from a marketing push, or you see we get a positive review. I mean, we've gotten such awesome reviews from for, from some people that we didn't expect. You know, like uh, a woman that's. Uh, an air force pilot that trained overseas all the time. Her mother wrote us and she's like, Hey, we just want to let you know my daughter has used this on deployment. She's using it every single day. She sits in planes for, you know, 10 hours a day and she gets stiff. And like, this thing has been a godsend. Thank you so much. Like stuff like that is super rewarding. You know, when you you see like a, an idea that you had that you, you brought to life, actually having an effect on people. So yeah, I mean, there's those positives, you know, far outlay and, and hopefully offset the the down days when, when there's a struggler. And then there's a, you know, lately we've had uh, some components that, you know, we've been producing for, or our suppliers have been producing for months, for over a year. And they sent us a shipment and the parts aren't right all of a sudden. <laughs> like, how does that happen? You've been producing yeah. thousands thousands of these pieces and and that part gets frustrating but then you realize you know it's all part of the journey and yeah you can, yeah you get smarter so uh, any advice that you you would give to the startup or the entrepreneur <sighs> yeah i mean there's there's so much advice right and and usually it all comes back to just just i like to say find what you're what you're excited about uh and it could be an idea, it could be, you know, a mission statement, it could just be making money, right? And if, if that's what you're excited about, you know, like, find a way that 
you can you can live with and you can breathe and die with every day for a set amount of time or indefinitely and and then go for it and you know be willing to make some sacrifices there's plenty of sacrifices and uh and starting up there's always a learning curve and i mean unless you've done it a couple times five times whatever it is and you have uh, a rolodex of investors that are willing to back your next project it's going to be a challenge and um you got to you have to be ready for it. You have to be willing to take it on with uh, some vigor. You're very educated. You've got quite the quite the list of education. So that to me says, you know, you you believe in education and knowledge. What other um, do you have other advisors or other mentors or other groups that you're involved with to get some additional support? Yeah, yeah. So I. I'm- I took advantage as much as I could. I mean, I went to Yale and I have a a peer group that I graduated with that are all doing kind of wild things and going out and like starting their own ventures now. You know, some are are working in finance and they just crush in finance and that's that's great. But then some, you know, are doing entrepreneurial entrepreneurial things and, and doing really well. And so using, you know, their knowledge, having conversations with them, having a peer group that, you know, is uh, is is really trying to go for it is is valuable, um, and then through the NFL, I took advantage of you know, kind of these continuing education programs. So the NFL has done a lot, I think, over the last decade to try to prepare guys for what that transition out of the NFL is like. It's a it's a tough thing. You're doing something that you always dreamed of doing. Uh, there is no guarantees in professional football. Uh, you see the guys that you know. You see the guys that that get drafted and get paid millions of dollars before they ever, ever step on the field. And then they're a bust, you know, they, they expect to have 10 year careers and, and it, you know, it's across the spectrum. You see the guys that didn't think they would make a team and they played 12 years and they are, they're very successful. So just realizing like through the process that there's going to be, be a day when you can't play anymore and having a plan for the rest of your life. I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I had an idea. Uh, I knew that, you know, I, I had a good background in education and, wanted to do be successful outside of football. I had those two things. And so I took advantage of the the programs through the NFL at, at Warden Business School, at Kellogg Business School, at Stanford. So um and there are these seminars and you get to learn from their their best professors over the course of a couple of days and you really get like a distilled uh, executive education. And so I took advantage of those and, and just continued to learn. I, I think you know those types of things are are valuable. You can, if you can continue to, to push yourself and to continue to grow, and it doesn't have to be those top notch schools. Like there's tons of good programs out there yeah. that you can find like the pivotal leader that will help you <laughs> to, to, you know, to find your path and to, to put you on the right track and just to have some accountability. Well, it's I funny. Think- it's funny you say that because um, I jokingly call the pivotal leader, my MBA program, because, <laughs> yeah. because the people that come on as guests, you know, have so much interesting experience and journeys. I learned so much. I I learned so much in the past year. I think it's made me a much better business person because of it. So I think, you know, podcasts are great, are a great way to, to, to learn as much as you can. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I do a ton of that. I mean, books on tape podcasts. Yeah. Free time, just going for a jog. Like you can use that to, to kind of double up. And, and yeah, so like through those programs and through just talking to people, I've, you know, acquired uh, a, a group of people that I can reach out to for advice. And like I said, it doesn't have to be that, those types of programs. It's finding people in your network yeah. that that have been there and have some advice for you and, and seeking them out and not, not being afraid to shoot them an email or pick up, pick the phone and call them. Well, I'm sure Lori and uh, Sarah have uh, some good coaching and networks for you. Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, like I said, they're outstanding businesswomen. So being part of their team and uh, having them a part of ours is is pretty great. That's pretty cool. All right, I've got um, one more question for you. You call yourself an NFL grinder. What, is, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's, you know, a guy that has the ability to play and has the, the want to more the drive maybe then um then the the outright numbers or or whatever you would call it to 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 be an NFL player and i i grinded i mean i worked my butt off i showed up at the facility i got there early i stayed late watched extra film um and 
you know, I always felt that I had the ability to be a perennial starter, to, to be one of the, the be- better players in the, the league. I knew the product I was putting on the practice field. And then when I did get the chance to play, the, the product that I was putting on the field was good enough to compete. And I always felt like I should be a starter. Um, but for whatever reason, there's, there's a lot of luck involved with being an NFL player, whether, you know, a lot of guys get their chance by somebody in front of them getting hurt. I had that happen once in my career and I also got hurt at the same time. So, I mean, like there's, there's some unfortunate things, but I made a career out of it just by pushing and by continuing to produce and having a good attitude. If you're, I think if you're going to start a business, uh, you have to be willing to grind. There's no doubt about it. You have to be able to, you know, get up each day and want it and push harder than the next guy. And it's kind of a sports cliche, but it's, it's truth. I mean, that's it. It's having grit. Well, that's uh, that's the quote that will kick off this podcast <laughs> when, uh, when I edit it, I'm always looking for a good sound bite. That was it. <laughs> okay, good. Hey, if people want to connect with you, um, get a hold of you, buy your product, what are some great ways to connect with you? So the easiest way to find us is at our website, which is Brazen Life. So B R A Z Y N L I F E dot com. Uh, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's Brazen underscore Life. Uh, again, Brazen with a Y. And yeah, I also you know I'm always looking to to help. You know, if there's any uh, fitness entrepreneurs or uh, fitness startups out there that that want advice. Feel free to reach out to us. You can reach us. There's um, a web form on the, the web page and uh, send us a note and it'll get to me and I, I'd be happy to hear your idea. And, and if I can help in any way, I'll certainly try to do that. So oh, that's great. I, yep. I know a lot of fitness coaches, so. Okay, cool. <laughs> you, that's awesome. <laughs> you, yeah. you might I'll get a little Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Gina, Gina said I can call you. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Well, hey, Nate, it was so great having you on the Pivotal Leader today. Thank you. Yeah, this has been really fun, Gina. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for listening to the Pivotal Leader today. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. You can find this podcast on iTunes. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave a rating and review and feel free to email me your questions about employee engagement and customer acquisition at Gina at Pivot10.com. And I'll email you back and uh, we will have show notes. We'll have all this information about Nate, uh, his personal phone number. Don't no, just kidding. Uh, any, and uh, we'll have all that in the show notes so you can connect with him. So check that out on the pivotal And again, if you have any questions, drop me a line and Hey, if you know a pivotal leader who should be on this podcast, let me know. Maybe that someone is you drop me a line and let's get you on the show. And my new closing motto for our listeners, If you want to maximize, you need to be willing to improvise. Now take us out, cool voiceover guy. You've been listening to The Pivotal Leader with Gina Tremarco, owner and founder of Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv Company. You can find show notes for this episode on our website at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. If your company needs help pivoting to success, visit pivot10results.com or email Gina at gina at pivot10results.com. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot.